<laughs> so the truth is, I wasn't brave for 41 years, but didn't know that. And that's why awakening to, I have to change how I'm operating, I have to change how I think about myself, all of that. That's why I love the word brave so much. The second favorite word I have in the English language is breakthrough, because my first book was Break Down, Breakthrough. Right. And I find that for most of us, we don't make the changes we need till there's a breakdown moment that the universe says, Haha, yeah, now's the time. Welcome to the Forge by Trust podcast. I'm your host, Robin Dreek, professional speaker, former U.S. Marine, spy recruiter, best-selling author, and your trust and communication expert. Coming up next on the Forge by Trust podcast. But what we have to do is open our eyes and look at what shaped us right. and, and do something about it. 98% of professional women have at least one of these damaging power and confidence gaps. And 90% of men have at least one. Yeah. But women have, 75% of women have three or more. And when you have these, Robin, you're not going to thrive. You will not thrive. He said, I know from where you sit, this looks like the worst crisis you've ever faced. From where I sit, it's the first moment you can choose who you want to be in the world. He didn't say what. He said who. The Forge by Trust podcast is a show where we explore the essential skill of forging trust for building an innovative culture and exceptional leadership. Join us as we delve into the behavior skills and communication techniques required for success and learn from the best in the industry. Our guests include spies, spy recruiters, master interrogators, best-selling authors, thought leaders, and innovators who will share their insights on building teams, partnerships, and exceptional leadership by forging trust. Today's episode, Unlocking Your Bravery, How to Transform Your Career Through Expanded Power, Impact, and Confidence is with my good friend, Kathy Caprino. Kathy Caprino is an international career and leadership coach, writer, speaker, and executive trainer helping professional women advance, thrive, and reach their highest, most rewarding potential. A former corporate VP, she is also a trained therapist, seasoned executive coach, senior Forbes contributor, top media source on women's issues, and the author of two books, including her latest, The Most Powerful You, Seven Bravery Boosting Paths to Career Bless, now offered as a training course for individuals and organizations. Kathy's been named a top career coach and leadership voice in the U.S. and abroad. During the episode today, we talk about the importance of self-assessment, recognizing personal talents, overcoming communication fears, and the necessity of aligning one's career with their true self for genuine happiness and fulfillment. Alrighty, Kathy, I've been looking forward to this for such a long time because I've been on your show and we're reversing it a number of years ago. And the title of your show really exemplifies you, and that is Finding Brave. I didn't really have an understanding of what that meant until I actually did a deeper dive and read your book, which was also incredible. And I want to go on that life journey and arc with you, if we could, all those years ago when you're younger, what do you think the spark was to finding the most powerful you and finding your brave? First of all, thank you for having me, Robin. I cannot wait to dive into these incredible questions I know you have brewing. I love this question. So I'm going to give you the short answer and then a little bit of, a, a, you know, a description of it. You bounce in my seat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the truth is I wasn't brave for 41 years, hmm. but didn't know that. And that's why awakening to, I have to change how I'm operating. I have to change how I think about myself all of that. That's why I love the word brave so much. The second favorite word I have in the English language is breakthrough because my first book was break down, break through. Right. And I find that for most of us, we don't make the changes we need till there's a breakdown moment that the universe says, Haha, yeah, now's the time. But to give you a, a little bit of a deep dive here, I had a lovely childhood. It was, you know, loving um, Greek mom, Italian dad, they're in heaven now. And where'd you grow up? Schenectady, New York, upstate yeah, New York. Yeah, yes, I'm a New Yorker as well. You are? Upstate? Um, Anything above New York City is upstate. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, upstate. Um, Putnam County, so oh not as far goodness. north as Schenectady. But yes, wow. woods, lakes, rocks. There you go. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful place to grow it up, is. right? It's expensive, but yes, beautiful yes. and cold. <laughs> I know, with snow. We had snow constantly. Yes. 
Loved it. And, you know, I would say as a child, there were some talents that I could see. And then as a teen, I, I honed those. So as we were talking earlier, I am a singer and a performer and I was a competitive tennis player. I was a number one on the tennis team. And I was also a writer. I was a writer on the paper. I'm telling you these things because it's part of the story I work with with my coaching clients. We are so much of who we really are early on. Oh, yeah. But often we don't recognize these as talents, right. as special, special gifts that we're meant to use in the world, either through your living or as a joy and a passion you know, in service to others, hopefully, right. because I think that's what makes us happiest. So what happened was, went to college, Boston U, studied English. I really wanted to be an editor that helped authors birth their ideas. Well, I bailed on that minute one, and I just took the first job I could. So let's go back a little bit first. Yes. Um, because you you dropped a lot of talents in, in your opening dialogue right there about the things you had in high school, singing, um, writing, uh, tennis. What do you think it was that made you leave some of those behind and pursue s something else in college? Ah, interesting. You, you were, I was going to what I did for 18 years that left them all behind, but you make a really good point. So I'm studying English. I love it. Made sense because I, I love ideas and I wanted to help birth ideas. But uh, okay, so now I'm curious about that. What was it about English that sparked mm -hmm. and birthed ideas? I mean, there's a lot of other subjects that we kind of do. Was there a specific teacher? Was there a moment? I'm just curious because, like English, I don't think of English as a as a, a place to spark ideas. I think uh, of philosophy or you know, yeah, yeah. you know, or, or 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 literary giants or something like that. Grant, that there's amazing thought leaders in that. When you look back at Epictetus and Plutarch and things like that. Um, Marcus Aurelius, I, I'm, as you can tell, I'm a stoic lover. Um, but I was just curious, English, I would have thought maybe history or something else. What was it? So what I mean by that is English literature. And I know ah, yeah, there that's you what I mean, but I want to tell you, I know where that comes from. I would say to my mom, who was the, not college educated, but the most well-read person I've ever met to, to, to this day. And I would say, Mom, I'm bored because I, I've always wanted, needed high stimulation. I was always doing so. Right. And she'd say, go read a book. If she said it once, she said it a thousand times. And I would. So I remember I had kind of the highest vocabulary in honors English in high school. But I loved, I loved fiction. I loved story. I loved storyline, what makes people do what they do. A lot of it is so psychologically based. Yeah. You know, Dostoevsky, my gosh, you know amazing Russian and other uh, from around the world. So it was English literature. It was story okay. that I loved. Right. So studying English made sense. Although my dad, who was a scientist, was like, oh gosh, why is she studying that? But also to answer your question, while I was a singer and I was in the plays and people said, oh, you're going to go on and be a singer, right? It never occurred to me to study music more than I had in high school. Huh. And I don't want to blame my parents, dad in particular, but I think we are so shaped by the expectations of our parents mm -hmm. that I think in the recesses of my mind, I knew if I said I really wanted to get an MFA or I wanted to study music, it, he would have really objected terribly right? because he didn't respect it. Right. And what kind he of was, scientist was he? He was a chemist, but he had a 30-year job at GE in right. silicone rubber, and he had seven patents, and he loved it so much. So I was shaped by – I was kind of like the son my dad didn't have. There's two two girls, two women, and you know my sibling and I. And I, I was very shaped by being very close to him as an athlete, as a competitor – and and I think in my mind, I said, I, I need to go into business and it needs to be a very big business. You know, publishing was that to me. But even uh, I was had an internship at MIT and I worked on the radio news station. And within a week, Robin, they said, speaking of voice, you've got a great voice. You want to yeah. read the news. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I can hear and, it. <laughs> and what did I say? I said, no. Oh, really? So from the minute I was on my own, 
I said no to these talents. And I remember going way deep. I was this sheltered kid from Schenectady. I was not a city girl. I was not brave. And the other thing is I could not speak up to my mother. Now, this sounds like a big brave fest. I tell everyone, brave, um, blaming. Did I say brave fest or blame fest? Brave. What I meant is blame <laughs> fest. Yeah. I don't want anyone to think I'm sitting here blaming my beloved parents. They did the best they could. They were second right. generation immigrants. My my mother was malnourished as a child. You know, they were poor. This is not blaming, but what we have to do is open our eyes and look at what shaped us right. and, and do something about it. Right. But I grew up not being able to speak up to my mom because she believed in authority. Right. You don't challenge your elders. You just don't. And she would get mad. She would get right. not abusive. She would just shut herself in her bedroom. And I did before she passed, which was last March at 98. When wow. I wrote this book, I asked her permission. I'm going to come out and say that I couldn't challenge my mother. Right. Are you okay with that? And she hesitated. And I'm, oh, no. And she said, yeah, I can imagine you felt that because I didn't believe that you should challenge me. You know, Kathy, having read your book, I, I take notes on the things I read. I'm sorry I'm using I statements in there. But what was really striking to me was it that played such a – obviously a big role in your life was asking your mother's permission to stay that uh, – to say that and share that. But that wasn't a huge takeaway for me, believe it or not. And so it play, it's always interesting. It played bigger in your life than I think – than – then it it was necessarily to others or you know like and then you even shared it in a book because the you had beautiful key points on being brave in the book and great examples and that was one of them but it didn't stand out as anything greater so it, it's you mean let me understand i'm going to act like you're on my podcast yeah. you mean so the act of asking mom when she was 94 um if she had said no i would have had a big problem with that because this is the message i wanted to get out in the world that we have to speak our truth we right. have to challenge we ha but lovingly right so uh, i'm so grateful we didn't have to go at it about me putting it out there but did you not get in the book that my biggest challenge was i had no boundaries i couldn't speak up for myself i attracted mistreatment i mean i had you know, the fast forward is 18 years of a yeah. career where there was a lot of bad stuff. That was, those were the stories where I gained your brave from, where I saw where you overcame that brave. It wasn't your mother. Um, you, In other words, what I'm trying to say so really poorly is that <laughs> the book was powerful and it will would have been powerful regardless of that um, that one data point that was, was huge in your life, but all your points from that point forward, it's just, it, it was just really fascinating. Um, I'm actually glad Robin, because I think that rec I recognize this challenge with my mother when I be started to become a therapist at age 41 yeah. and, you know, to be a therapist, a good therapy program turns you inside out. Right. If you're not looking at everything, you're not, you know, and, um, it began to occur to me, oh my goodness, I, I can't speak up for myself. I could see it in my classes at 41. I'd say, I'd ask a question that would challenge the professor and she'd get mad. And I would think I'm going to get drummed out of the program. And my right. friends would be like, oh, brother, Kathy, you, you got a skewed view. I ended up passing with distinction. So, um, so but I'm glad that in the book, it, it doesn't wax on and on about mom because- yeah, it doesn't. But but now I get it because that is obviously the the origin of the arc of not speaking up for yourself, right. which manifested and grew as as time progressed into these really more powerful stories. But that's where it started. That's why it is what what a what a great opportunity you had to get that permission through being brave before she had passed and it's to really do that. True. It's yeah, really what, true. What a gift. I uh, thanks, Mom. I so agree. The yeah. other thing that I learned from my parents, which holds women back today, and some of it is a little of the patriarchal system, which we'll talk about. My mother would say, "I don't 
you know, some, I was in a show and I was one of the leads and afterwards in the grocery store, some mother came up and went, oh, you're Kathy, made a big deal about it. And <laughs> I think I, I puffed up a little, right? I sure, was, sure. what was I, eight, 17? Later, she said, I don't like this, tone it down. I don't like you being a braggart. I'll never forget it. Right. Um, and this is what women suffer with, not in that particular way, but we're often taught, do not be overconfident. Do not be assertive. Right. Do not be strong. You know, be accommodating, pleasing. Right. Moderating, putting other people first. So these two lessons are really the, the genesis of how we can have what it seems to be a successful life. But I say that, speaking about the book and the seven damaging power gaps, my survey showed that 98% of professional women have at least one of these damaging power and confidence gaps. And 90% of men have at least one. Yeah. But women have, 75% of women have three or more. And when you have these, Robin, you're not going to thrive. You will not thrive. You yeah. may, may make a lot of money. You might have a big house. You might have a big title. But internally, you're not going to thrive. Yeah, where yeah. it really matters. Because then it gets linked to, and you talked about this as well, that internal thriving, not the external, is where our health comes from. Well, you bring up an amazing point. I mean, so many people have health issues. I learned in therapy, your body says what your lips cannot. I body know this is- score. That's it. I know this is a theme for you and you yeah. know it. Powerful. Right. It's so important. So, all right. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I love these rabbit holes. I got my goosebumps <laughs> going. They're very enriching in life. Um, because I want to get to eventually our, your profound self-awareness and when that really started sparking. Because we're not there yet, but we're, all right, we're college, we're majoring English, we're walking this path. Uh, what was next? So, you know, I, I really did bail on the, the thrilling dream for the life, and it was for money. I lived in Brooklyn. I was 22. Hold on. Oh, your language usage is so beautiful. Obviously, what did I say? I don't even know. The thrilling journey of life. Define thrilling journey of life for Kathy back then you thought it was that you were bailing on. I, I think I, I had a sense that I wanted to be of use in a way, you know, if, if you think about being an editor, you're going to bring new ideas to the forefront and you're going to help brilliant people who have something to say, say it. Right. Huh. Uh, so, I mean, uh, again, none of this was crystallized. I, I'm, I was like a lot of other people. You just, you're on a track. Right. This looks good. I like English. Interestingly, I was in the School of Public Com Communication for media. I took one class and said, I hate this. And what school again? Uh, Boston University. Right. So I, I wanted a school that had public communications. I said, I hate it. It was teaching the how, what, when, where, and why. And I thought, oh, and, I, <laughs> and how funny that I've been writing on Forbes for 10 years, you know, right. uh, not journalistically, but I find that really funny that I rejected it. I really loved richer ideas that you could go along. Anyway, the bailing of it was I get out. Back then, I'm, I'm aging myself, Smith Corona typewriter with the resume. <laughs> <laughs> a blue, I loved it. Yes. It was so big. And yes, luckily, we used to have typing classes in high school. Yes, I remember my wife I'm and a, I both took typing. <laughs> I, I did too. I'm a great typist. Anyway, sent them out. I got, I got and took the very first job that was offered to me, marketing in science journals and books. Good grief. And, you know, copywriting. So this is lesson number one of 700,000 things. Just doing what you're good at for a living is not a recipe for happiness. You have to like it. It has to connect with you somehow. Right. So I was very good at writing marketing copy for, you know, scientific journals. But my God, I was bored. And the company, the first company was really not full of integrity. About two weeks after I took that job, I heard from Simon & Schuster. Mm. At, you know, one of the New York publishing yeah, yeah, companies yeah. I'd kill to work for. And it was for assistant editor that I had applied. And they said, we'd love to have you in. Robin, what do I do, do you think? Do I go or do I not go, knowing what I just said? I didn't go on the interview. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so how did you even get, so how old were you at this time? 22. 
How did you get that interview? What are people seeing? What did they see in you that they wanted you part of that at that age, you think? Um, I had very good grades. I um, I wrote on the school paper, MIT. You know, I what do, what do people hire today? They're looking for someone with a demonstrated interest in. So they wanted an assistant editor would be someone who's worked with words, maybe published something, worked on a newspaper, demonstrated that throughout throughout, you know, the time period they're looking at college. And so I, I did have all that good grades there and, um, you know, Had doing you done some... an interview or anything for it. This was just sending out the resume. And, you oh. know, back then yeah, yeah, yeah. they looked at the resume and said, would you come in? You didn't right. even speak on the phone. They had you in. Right. I, I believe they were yeah, all yeah, in person. I'm, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So it was, you know, I had tip the typical stuff, I think really. All right. So we said no. And what did I say to myself? Oh my gosh, I want this job so badly. I'd take it, you know, I don't care what they say, I want it. But I, what would this company say if I quit? So do you see the through line is good girl, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Never upset people. I mean, it isn't great to quit after three, not, not after three weeks, not great. But if you're going to the career of your dreams and you hate the job already, why wouldn't you just go on the interview? Yeah. So lesson number 400, just interview people. You hate what you're doing. You don't feel you're so many women. I've worked with over 20,000 women now across you know six continents. They'll say to me how miserable they are and they've been miserable for years. So I say, are you interviewing? No. Why aren't you interviewing? I don't mean to sound snarky. I know the answer because they're afraid in every way. They're afraid of what it's going to lead to. They're afraid that, afraid that they're going to have to give up their great house and their great salary. They're afraid they're going to bomb it. They're afraid they're going to get rejected. Uh, oh, my Lord. So what happened was I stayed 18 years in, and I did find a book club company, Macmillan Book Clubs, and I became yeah. their product development manager, uh, and, and that was research. Turns out I love research. So it was quantitative and qualitative focus group surveys to develop new products. Your, and your, your father's coming through in you in the research side. Isn't that's it. <laughs> it. But there's an interesting story there. I did well. I was very well respected in that, but I didn't had never studied statistics, research mm -hmm. methodology. So another point is I lived with this dirty little secret that I don't really know enough, I thought to myself. Right. And if they find out, it's going to be bad. So Robin... They they loved, loved me. I was there eleven years. Why didn't I ask? Can, uh, NYU was you know a mile away. Why didn't I ask to take? Could you please support me and pay for me taking a research course, a mm -hmm. statistics? No, I didn't want to admit it. So this is you know something I also see. We have dirty little secrets. If they only knew, Shame. they would reject me. Shame is hard. 18 years, and it culminated in a vice president job where I was I was mistreated, Robin. Sexual harassment, gender discrimination, gender bias, toxic colleagues, narcissistic bosses. I didn't even know what narcissism was. Now, unfortunately, I'm a bit of an expert. Right. Um, and worse than that, I was chronically ill, actually. Every four months, I had an infection of the trachea, of all things. No speaking, no singing. Couldn't my kids were little then? They're twenty six and twenty nine. I couldn't even utter a word because I was, it was so inflamed. And I remember being so enraged. I didn't understand why am I so enraged? Because it was all about. I went to an energy healer. Actually, didn't believe in that at the time. Now I've studied energy healing. Two of them said, "What do you do for a living?" And I said, and they one of them said, "This is a crying within," mm -hmm. and the other said, "This is the seat of your personal expression." Mm -hmm. You're lying in in what you're doing. You yeah. you know, this is not who you really are. Oh my gosh. Well, I didn't make a change, Robin. Why not? I think about that a lot. I made a lot of money and I worked about five minutes away from my my kids mm -hmm. instead of commuting to the city. And I even interviewed and I got an offer, but it was twenty thousand dollars left less. And I said to myself, I'm not going backwards around money, which is an interesting thing because I think it would have been a great job and it would have been a, a great for me. But what I did do, unfortunately, I had, they brought in a person who was a change agent uh, and he was the CEO. And he would look at me. I managed $30 million budgets. Robin. I had a big job, vice president. 
he would look at me when I would speak as if, why don't you go clean the kitchen? I don't, I never had that before. I, I, I didn't understand what, why do I have this feeling that he it, it is so demeaning to me? And he would kind of diminish me in big meetings. So I went to the, the current president and the head of HR and they said, we see what you, we see what you're talking about, but That's our protocol gone. is that you have to go talk to him directly. And I did. Well, I believe he is a narcissist. You do not take on a narcissist. Mm. You do not do it. And I believe he got furious. I The meeting was us. He goes, walk with me. And he smoked his cigarette as we walked around the building. Not in his office, not respectfully. He got furious and said, I don't know what you're talking about. You're making it up. That's not true. And I believe I was kind of marked from that point on. I, I was also promised get the biggest house you can because you have a long career here. And we were looking for a new home. We bought, we went to another area. We bought it. One month after moving into the home was 9-11. And one month later, I was laid off with a hundred people, but laid off in a way that was absolutely brutal to me. And I snapped. I said, I have had enough. I've got to figure out why this bad stuff keeps happening to me. I mean, layoffs are layoffs, but it, I felt betrayed really because right. I had been promoted. I had been given big raises. There seemed no reason to me. Uh, and I was sitting in my therapist's office crying. And this is a statement I will never forget. And I say it to other people. He said, I know from where you sit, this looks like the worst crisis you've ever faced. From where I sit, it's the first moment you can choose who you want to be in the world. He didn't say what, he said who. And he said, who do you want to be? And I said, I don't know. I want to be you. And we laughed. We right. both, and he said, what does that mean to you? And I said, I want to help people, not hurt people and be hurt. I'm curious, what inspired you to start therapy, if I could ask? Because that requires a great amount of humility and self-awareness. And sometimes when we get caught up in the cult of more and the disease of comparison, we don't want to do that. You know, you ask the most juicy questions. I love this, the answer to this question because it's embarrassing. You don't have about, to share if you don't want. <laughs> oh, no, I love it. Nothing's, nothing's off, off record here. What's, what's, I'm an open book. Right. I had a friend over, a really dear friend, spending the night with me in Connecticut. And I was telling her about the bosses that I'd had and that this boss was no different. And she said, you know, I love you, Kathy. I'm your staunchest supporter. But what's going on that every boss you've had is pretty bad, horrible to you? And then she said, I think therapy would help. And Robin, I was so mad and hurt. I thought to myself, what kind of friend is this? It's a great friend. It's a great friend. And yeah. I went and got spiritual psychotherapy, which was life-changing. Yeah, Wow. And he was the one at in that moment who said, when I said, I want to be you, he said, I think you'd make a great marriage and family therapist, which is a genre that is not offered in every school in every state, but sure. it is in, in Connecticut. She was right. What I, what I discovered is I don't suffer fools lightly. Right. I am not one who, can I swear on your podcast? Sure. I don't like bullshit and I don't like being lied to. And I don't like crappy leaders. And, and I also don't like to be hemmed in. Like back then, we all had to go into the office. There'd be a meeting at Monday morning at eight with 50 of us. And, and back then, 20 years ago, I, I said out loud, why do we all have to be here? Why can't some of us call in? Why can't we cut this down? And we only have one representative from each division. It was like sacrilege. Right. You're not a team player. All right. So I, I, I always felt hemmed in by other people's rules. So I said, you're not going back to corporate life, but you are going to figure this out. And you are, let's, let's try becoming a therapist and see what happens. No, I was all in on becoming a therapist. But what happened was after doing the internship and starting a practice, it was not the professional identity that I wanted to end in because it's sure. rough. Rape, incest, pedophilia, suicidality, drug addiction. One of my clients 
His mother called and said, he's not coming in. He's in jail. He attempted murder. And I thought, I had a client, I've told the story a hundred times. Um, my kids, little kids were sitting down for dinner. My client called me and said, she was very depressed. And she said, I'm driving my car and I'm going to wrap it around a tree right now. This is it. And I thought to myself, I was not long out, out of my internship. I thought to myself for a split second, I don't have what it takes to help. That's what I thought. And the other thing, to be brutally honest, why not? I don't want this in my life. Right. I snapped out of it, thank goodness. That was a micro millisecond. We got her help. She did much, much better. We had a team of people helping. But I then said, this is not the, the end of the journey. Right. Just more life reps. You needed those life reps to keep you moving down your path. And I needed what I learned, yeah. which I'm doing all the talking, not letting you get a word in edgewise, but your podcast, Forged by Trust, I do want to share this because I think it's relevant today. If if I think about what makes me a successful coach or a writer or an interviewer or whatever, I think trust is at the heart of it. And then when I think about well, how do I demonstrate that? I think about my first months of internship as a therapist. And I had a guy who was a client who was mandated by the courts to come see us because he was physically abusing, hitting his daughter, who I think was like 16. Mm. And I, had ki I have kids. That is the most abhorrent thing, almost, so I'm sitting with him in the first session and I'm repulsed. And he, and, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do here? I don't, ugh. so the session ended, didn't go too well. I talked to my supervisor who is an angel on earth and she said, I'm going to give you the best advice I can give you. You can't help someone that you don't love. You have got, you have got to find something that you can love in this human being. She didn't say connect to, mm -hmm. she didn't say empathize with, she said love. Mm -hmm. You have got to find it. I'm not gonna tell you where to find it. I'm not gonna tell you how, but people sense when you are sitting in judgment of them. 100%. They sense when there's a separation, when there's disdain. You can only help them when you connect from the heart. 100%. It's like, what the heck? How am I gonna do this? The next session I went in with, I gotta find something, I gotta find something. And I asked the question, call him Fred. Fred, what what compels you? What draws you to hitting Susie? And he looked at me and he said, look at me choking up 20 years ago. She, she doesn't respect me. And it's the only way I have to have her respect me. Now we understand that hitting someone, you're never gonna get respect, but I looked in his face, Robin. That was his toolbox. And, mm -hmm. and guess what? He was hit as a child, his father hit him, yep, of course. Right. And he respected his father for reasons who knows. Um, but I just like, f not fell in love with him, but I felt devastated for him. That is a great way to put that. I felt devastated for felt him. devastated for him. This poor person wanted the love and respect of his daughter. So I said, I know that that's what you want. I feel it in my heart. But I'm not sure you know that hitting will never get that. And he, because he, I think, I don't know, I didn't analyze it after, but he did amazingly in therapy. But if I'd come at him like, you dummy, this is not going to work. Forget it. I think he felt that I felt for him. I haven't talked about this in years. But I think that empathy, and I don't mean compassion. I literally mean sit your butt in that person's shoes. 100%. If, and we don't have it today. Our very polarized, we're not going to go there. But... I was talking to three Canadians I was having a meeting with, and I happened to, I haven't met a Canadian I don't love, and I, I think maybe I'm going to move to Canada, jokingly, but maybe not. And I asked them what they think of their prime minister, and they they all were taken aback, and they, their eyes went wide, and I went, I'm sorry. And, and 
the, the senior guy said, one thing we're different about, we in Canada, we don't talk about politics. We don't even know who our friends voted for. And it is a three-party system. I won't get political. But in my lifetime, I've seen empathy erode. And it's it's hurting us all. I think it's hurting us all. Empathy requires effort. It requires letting go of ego and vanity or insecurities, our own personal confirmation biases. And it's work to walk a mile in someone else's shoes and take off yours first, as Brene Brown says. Um, and it's it's an effort, but it's an effort so worth it because if you don't understand someone else's context, how can you possibly connect? If you're judging everything out of their mouth as right or wrong according to your own values, then if your own values are I mean, just as an analogy, you know, say that you think you live in an area that, you know, everyone around you agrees with you. Well, everyone around you could equate to about 70,000 people. All right. So 70,000 people out of the billion, couple billion on this planet is what? <laughs> you know, and you and you fall into a group think confirmation bias mentality and now you're judging the rest of the world. And then that's really not the the hard part of it or the worst part of it is goes back to the things that you are impacted by health if you're constantly looking and seeing what's wrong or not even what's wrong what doesn't agree with you what's that doing internally our cells do not respond well to 100 percent stress anxiety right. and all these negative emotions all the time it ages us immensely. It destroys things in our bodies. Our genetics and biology play an awful lot into our health and well-being in the long run, but more so is our mental state in which we face life. And, and when if you can't find a healthy way to engage life, you're dooming yourself to a shorter life. I'm sorry I monologued on that. Oh, no, I love it. I couldn't agree but more. Yeah. And, I, and I have this other corollary to that. This same spiritual psychotherapist said to me, you know, Kathy, this is not doubling down on you, but you seem like a very judgmental person. I don't mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to love that person. I know. And he Drop said, I don't mean me. On you. <laughs> I don't mean cruel. I mean that you say this is good. This is bad. Ooh, I yeah. hate the rain. Judgments. Yeah, yeah. And I ask all of you to try this. He said, I'm going to give you an exercise. In the next week, I want you to do this. Every time you have a thought that involves a judgment, I want you to make a mental check mark and say, there goes one of those judging thoughts. But here's what I want you to do. Don't judge yourself for having the judgment. Let it go. And, and there's two reasons for that. You can't change your thoughts if you don't know what your thoughts are. So separate, give a moment of separation of your thoughts and then lovingly, unjudgmentally let it go. I came in a week later. And I said, okay, doc, I got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, what? I said, I must have done it wrong. And then we howled because there's the judgment. I said, I don't not have a judging thought. After 1,421 judging thoughts, <laughs> I, I, I was like, where are the non-judging thoughts? But that was making me sick. Right. You are right. And, and that doesn't mean... Don't be discerning. I mean, we have to have a radar up. Do I want to engage with you? Do I want to talk to you? I don't think so. That's okay. Right. That's okay. But if everything is a judgment, it's good, bad, ugly, beautiful, stupid, smart. It's, it's you know, a, a, it's a Buddhist thought. You know, it 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 is going to make you miserable. It's going to make you sick and miserable. And it's going to separate you from the and world. I think one of the easiest things to help on that path is if, again, these are initial impulses we get as a human being from our conditioning that happens early on in life, and we can't we can't change that, but we can add to it. And so I think adding from the judging part to we can shift an emotion into curiosity. You shift it to the curiosity about the path that someone else is walking. Now it just becomes an excitement. It's like, oh, I want to find out about that. That is just so different from me. I've never, I, 
I, I'm I'm so much like you in so many of these areas. Again, feeling so bad I'm talking more than I normally talk on my it's own your show. podcast. Yeah, I never go for it. it it's all about my guest. Um, but it's so true when you can add that element of curiosity because our own self awareness comes at a point of this isn't healthy. What I'm doing is not working. And it's a simple thing of take that same energy and just shift it to that that deep curiosity about the path of others. You're going to be so enlightened by newness. I mean, just it's just crazy how everyone is just so fascinating. Their past, and, and as you're describing, I've had that same experience when you're working espionage and recruiting spies for the FBI and inspiring people to confess to having done really, really bad things. And it's interesting if someone's committed true espionage, I guarantee you that's not the only thing that's gone sideways in their life because there's a decision-making process which is really unhealthy and harmful to themselves and others. And a lot of it involved doing bad things to people. And a lot of times they were people much younger, as all I'll say, before getting really dark on it. Really? And, oh my God, yeah. And so- I've had this same interview before where if you're trying to inspire someone to confess about all the heinous things they did to someone because you're trying to save other lives and get them into therapy, if you're sitting in judgment of that person, are they going to share with you? If you're shaming them, if you're taking that shame and showing it to them, are they going to share with you? Never. No. It's about not empathize. Like, like you're saying, it's not about agreeing with someone. It's about understanding the life that they led to that point and and what and how did you say that it, it's it's oh you had to say um it, it's that it's that phrase that um seeing their it's basically seeing and seeing the pain that they went through and, and there it is yeah and so connecting there because very rarely is someone so mentally broken that it's, you know, I mean, when we're dealing with serial killers that have, are high in psychopathy, that is a broken brain. Right. Most people don't have broken brains. They have broken experiences. And so wow. bringing someone back from that where they don't want to do harm, but they didn't realize the harm they're doing, that's where you're talking. That's where finding that brave comes in. So... I yeah. have to ask you a question. You got to come on my podcast soon and we'll, we'll yeah, you get, I'm, I'm you get the mic. too much. <laughs> no, no. But can I ask you something? Oh, 100%. You, do you find that people involved in espionage, and by that you mean they're spying against their country, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Yeah. Um, Deep betrayal. Do, are you finding that because they've done heinous things, there's a hatred of themselves and this oh, 100%. is- that's and spying is is what is it? Spying is a way they can They're, mitigate that self hatred. In generally, in general, like most people that are dealing with life's greatest challenges, they're wound collectors. They've been wronged, and they're going to right the wrongs, and and they have a scorecard, and they're going to take out retribution on others, or they feel like a victim. You know, they're addicted to being a victim mentality, and so. Most of these things come from toxic shame earlier in life, insecurities. The the as we we're alluding to in one of the books I, I love is Body Keeps a Score. The trauma that they experienced earlier in life, without a broken broken genetic and biological brain, but they've had broken experiences that they're trying to overcome these things. I mean, we all have these life arcs. I mean, you went through your life right. arc of right. you didn't have the braveness you needed and the power inside to to break out of that arc for a while. These people have a, a deeper arc that's been ingrained so powerfully that they're taking it out in all these ways that are extremely unhealthy um, to themselves and without even realizing it. So yeah, it's it's just broken. <laughs> that's heartbreaking. It is I heartbreaking. Just, and and then and, and so and Kat, that is the most incredible thing that people sometimes have a hard time with is that this is what we're talking about. This is what where you make a connection. This is not saying these people actions were righteous or good or that we agree with it. But what you can say is you can recognize the behavior and say that behavior happened because there's something heartbreaking in there. Now what are we going to do I, about I think it? this is the key that I, I want to just leave folks with. 
Yeah, we can be, I mean, I've, I'm no saint, don't get me wrong, but we, we can be self-righteous. We can say, what a dummy to believe that. I think the, the point is, what do you want in life? Do you want to connect? Mm -hmm. Do you want to learn? Do you want to be curious? Do you want to open doors or do you just want to shut it down? Mm -hmm. But to your point, it takes a lot of work yeah. to find something to love in somebody that is doing something abhorrent. And, uh, you know, again, I, I'm not an expert at this all the time or in my personal life all the time, but I'm a lot happier and healthier that I try. That's what I would say. Yeah, it's a perfectly said. Whew. What a journey this has been. So, all right, so Kathy, well, let's talk about the spark that put us on the brave path and a couple areas that people can start focusing on. So if you're listening to this, you're watching this, you're saying, my gosh, I need a little bit more of this healthy in my life. Because that's what it comes down to, I think, is having a good, healthy life here. Like you said, success in here is the health that we have in, inside ourselves because longevity should be really our goal and longevity not just living a long life but a long life of high functioning emotional con connectivity with the world and ourselves that's a great goal and that's not going to come from title and success as uh, society will define it or a, a or a little niche but those healthy connections we make and it comes from finding our brave <laughs> all right you're asking me where do we start um I have something, not to be salesy, but I have something called a career path self-assessment, 11 pages of questions I wish someone had asked me when I was 18. And if great, I- what a, what a great question. You know, that you just answered that question. So what would you ask your 20-year-old self or tell your 20-year-old self now that you knew now? No, no, that you didn't know then? You got it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and it's, yeah. If you answer these questions honestly, I and they're everything from- how you stood out as a child, you know, was there a traumatic moment that is still with you? Every job you ever had, what you loved, what you hated, what your shining moments were, what you never want to do it again. It's amazing. Um, what I, what I want to say to you is take this thing, do it, and we'll have a link to just downloading it for free. Yep. What I think you're going to see are there, there are some dots to connect. And what I want everybody to understand, and this is just fact, Everyone is like their thumbprint. They are unlike anyone else. They don't see it though. So they might say, yeah, but I'm a marketer and there's a million digital marketers. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the amalgam of who you are, the trials, the tribulations, the traumas, the ancestry, the languages you speak, where you lived, everything that makes you you, your hobbies, your passions, what you're angry about. You have got to understand that if you want a happy life, but mm -hmm. most people don't. So, you know, if we look at these seven gaps and they are, you know, not recognizing your special talents, communicating from fear, not strength, isolating from influential support, reluctance to ask for what you want and deserve, acquiescing instead of saying stop to mistreatment, losing sight of your thrilling dream for your life. And the final one is allowing the past to continue to define you not in a good way, typically. If most people have more than one of these gaps, where I would ask you to start to find brave is start to recognize how you are amazing and everyone is. And if you resist it and don't see it and don't believe it, there are steps in the book, you know, can, you can work with me. One is get your tush on LinkedIn. And I, Robin, I say that I can look at people for three minutes on LinkedIn, not five, three and I can tell so much about you and your career that you don't even know. Like, are you hiding? Are you not aware of what your talents are? Are you not aware of the outcomes of who you are in the world? You've got to do this work if you want to be happy, if you want to understand how to be of service of other with, to other people in ways that make you proud. You've got to start here. That's what, that's what I would say. Ugh. <laughs> I know. I just want to talk to you all day long. <laughs> oh, that's so kind. That is such good, powerful content. This is I. I can't thank you from the bottom of my heart for having probably the greatest conversation of the year so far. Oh, um, that's so kind. Rich. 
And I feel so for everyone listening that's tuned into the show before. I apologize for talking more than I ever talk on these things, but I love Kathy, you just inspired me to want to share. So with that, I want to make sure that what didn't I ask you that I should have asked you that you wanted to make sure you shared before we did go, we went down a lot of roads, but I want to make sure that we got in some nooks and crannies that I might've missed. I don't think you missed a thing. I think we're good. Unless there's a burning thing that makes you say, wait, I don't get it. If there's one of those, I'm happy to answer. But- oh my gosh, no. We we hit the core content, I think, of a life well-filled, a life well-fulfilled, um, the, the starting point, what to do next. Uh, it's beautiful. Thank you so yeah. much for oh, coming on and sharing. Thank you for your deep, deep questions. I know that we're simpatico in a lot of ways for you oh to even go the directions you went. Thank you for digging deep and having me. I appreciate it so much. Uh, thank you. We'll do this again. Yes. And <laughs> I'm sending you the materials to come on my show soon. Awesome. Gotta have you. I'll talk to you soon, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Forge by Trust. Remember, if you want to forge trust, it's not how you make people feel about you that matters. It's how you make them feel about themselves. If you're interested in more information about how I can help you forge your own trust building, communication, and interpersonal strategies as a speaker, your coach, or as a trusted advisor for you or your organization, please visit me on my website at robindreek.com. See you next time on Forged by Trust.